I know you through your film Aya Awakenings and one of my favorite podcasts, In a Perfect World. Mm -hmm. And you also have a book based on the movie. And also called Aya Awakenings, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And a new project now, Shamans in a Global Village. Would you like to tell us about that? Yeah. So basically, this is my 10th anniversary of working with sacred medicines, predominantly ayahuasca. And, uh, you know, I, I feel that for, for the, the depth of the intensity of the journey or journeys you have, there's also an equal time of integration. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I first went down to, uh, to Iquitos and experienced ayahuasca and was writing about it for what started out for a magazine article and then became this three month, 30 chapter book, um, <clears throat> it took like a few years to get the book out and then the marketing of the book and then in 2000, that was in 2006, so at the, the apex of launching the book, the film started with my the director of the film, Tim Parrish, and Lulu Medill did the soundscape, so we did a, um, a spoken word readings from the book, and they essentially became the backbone for the film, and then that took me all the way through to about early 2014, so, you know, I was on like an eight-year journey of literally, really, integrating through... I say like my words and my media is my medicine and uh, making shamanic artifacts and trying to anchor and capture some of the essence of these experiences through my own personal lens to comment on a more tribal and group initiation I think we're all going through essentially as a species these days with uh, mediated plant and earth medicine activation. Mm -hmm. And so all of that has been this overarching journey that's taken me up to my 10th anniversary now, and we're just launching uh, a new venture called shamansofthegloballvillage.com, and uh, it's essentially a documentary series which is planned for about 6 to 12 episodes to look at the different entheogenic medicines that the earth secretes herself to uh, bring humans into right relationship and to have this sort of um, ally relationship with the, the spirits and the medicines. And to look at the role of the shaman, you know, look at the role of the medicine person, a man or woman who has connection from the earth, producing these substances to then uh, the substance themselves and then the human who's the vessel or the caretaker of the spirit. And often indigenous people have been caretakers of these plants and medicines. And now there's a new generation of Western people who are going through the growing pains and also the responsibility mm. and the learning curve of uh, taking on board of what it means to be medicine people or shamans in the global village. So I see there's this rebalancing happening mm. around the earth where it's not just about indigenous people. Essentially, we're all indigenous to the planet, but a lot of the um, the, the Western culture, what Terence McKenna used to call dominated culture, the, mm. e the ego culture that has spread out to all areas of the world and infected with this globalism and this egoism, uh, which I feel as well as also not just a byproduct, but as a dir direct result of, um, I guess, the, the shorthand for it is seasons of consciousness or world ages that we've been in, uh, in that there seems to be now a fruition point and a tipping point and a blossoming of this new energy coming through from the planet herself and then from deeper galactic sources, uh, which fits this idea of many, you know, indigenous cultures have had of world ages. And so we're seeing this global shamanic resurgence, which, you know, is, is fruiting almost everywhere around the planet with Westerners who have inherited the dogmas and the energies and the egoic structures and the wounds of six to 10,000 years of his story. Right. Mm. And so what, what we really hope to do with Shamans of the Global Village is to show this lineage between the planet and the plants and earth medicines and the people. And so that includes the indigenous caretakers now handing the baton to the Westerners so we can become unified and we can recognize ourselves more as one, one tribe, you know, who mm -hmm. is connected to the earth and is resonating in right relationship with the earth. That's essentially the, the, the gist of the show. So the first episode we shot last year in Mexico with Dr. Octavio Rettig, mm -hmm. who's a Mexican drain doctor who works with the Bufo Alvarius toad medicine, which contains the Western idea of the chemical of 5-MeO-DMT. Now 5-MeO-DMT is also endogenous to the human brain. Uh, it's in plant kingdom. It's in different animals as well. Uh, in a sense, we're neurologically wired for it. We're hardwired for God. <laughs> That's what it is, essentially. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I have a bit of a soundbite mechanism in me. Like, I, I just conjugate this language. 
Uh, but I feel that's part of my, my gift of, you know, I, it doesn't come from here, it comes more from the heart. But 5-MeO-DMT and the tryptamines essentially uh, are almost like, you know, God's backdoor access that he's put into the species to connect us to unity consciousness, to source itself. Mm. So, you know, you have to watch the episode because these are all buzzwords and these might just sound like words, but it's a very profound medicine, uh, very, very profound medicine. Like I feel that in my training, someone said to me years ago that the different entheogens are like baubles on the different branches of a Christmas tree or the tree of life itself. And that the 5-MeO is the star at the, the top of the tree, it's the light. Mm -hmm. And um, what I see in my eight year integration process of uh, integrating what I went through in Eye Awakenings and becoming part of the global medicine community uh, is that it's a process and there's different levels of this process going on all at the same time in holographic perfection, right? And we get the medicines we need when it's time for them. And there's essentially a, a paralleling cascade going on that I feel that in the, in the sixties, we, the Western culture had LSD as a opening of the mind. And we needed that because we were so distanced from the garden because mm -hmm. white picket fence of America and, and the allies essentially post-World War II won the war, but it was the, like the inheritance of um, mechanistic Victorian culture, which had been, you know, the whole split between mind body and science and alchemy and magic and rationalism and, you know, God is dead, all these isms and all these accrued cultural forms culminated post-World War II in this, this empire which had conquered the world. And it's the same empire which for 6,000 years had started to kill off all the medicine people and the witches and the mm -hmm. herbal people. And when it went back to indigenous cultures in the first world, started to repress and see his work of the devil, you know, the magic mushrooms or the washuma cactus or... It could not handle ego dissolving substances that connected to a larger energetic ecology. Mm -hmm. So at that, ex so at that exact moment, uh, the LSD revolution happened. It, it came through the lab with Albert Hoffman, and essentially, you know, there's a whole story there. But essentially, what I feel is that LSD helped open the mind and it helped release a planetary blockage. Mm -hmm. A generation later, and these are all lab based things, but ecstasy. There was an ecstasy revolution that helped open the heart. A generation after that the plant medicine uh, movement started to really peak in the West, predominantly with ayahuasca, which helped to really tune in and open the soul. So there seems to be, to me, a cascade culturally over 20th century and the 21st, preparing us to return to the garden because white picket fence America mm -hmm. wasn't ready for the plants because it was the inheritor of dominated culture which had severed the connection to the plants. So we had to go through these, these permissions and protocols and portals of, of initiation to now have this global uh, plant and entheogen based movement. And so even within the plant based movement, I see that there's essentially most of the entheogens are very good at healing and, you know, some of them help specifically with addictions. Some of them help just reveal things we've suppressed or, or open us up to the web of life and reconnect us. You know, the, the original Latin word for religion is to reweave. Or to reconnect and then you go to mm. ask to what and it's it's to spirit right mm -hmm. and so after a decade of working with ayahuasca who i still dearly love and work with and do ayahuasca retreats at least once a year down in peru mm -hmm. with my curandero percy garcia lozano last year i was introduced to the the toad medicine with dr octavio reddig and then everything changed very rapidly and i started to see that there's even within the plant medicines it's like they're, they're clean cleaning and cleansing and healing us and then if we return to our default state, to our uh, optimal electromagnetic frequency of, of being open, then we can receive the light. And it seems like the light, as the analogy at the top of the Christmas tree, is what is really coming onto planet Earth through the shamanic movement at the moment. So funnily enough, Shamans of the Global Village documents episode one, this work with the toad medicine, and then hopefully episode two is going to be documenting Iboga and Gabon, and we've essentially want to go around the planet and look at the, the connection of the medicines and the, the medicine people and what's going on with this movement, this shamanic mm -hmm. movement and how that, what's the value of it? How does it help us make us better people? How does it connect us to ourselves and to the planet, to our communities and to spirit? Because, you know, being a medicine person yourself, these are incredibly profound experiences uh, that uh our birthright and are really something which you know connects us to 
what's really going on and what's really important. If there's if there's ever really going to be a change on planet Earth with the emergency we have, not just ecologically, but politically, socially, economically, we need to change not just our consciousness, but we need to open our heart. And I think that's mm-hmm. what these substances are very good at doing. It's probably the root of all of it. Yeah, so yeah. I, I feel it's no accident that these medicines are on the move. They're, they're reaching a lot of people mm. quite rapidly right now. Do you sense that that's related to the ecological, social, political state? Yeah, I do. I mean, there's a few commentators that have said this, and they've said this for about for about a, or a couple of generations now, all the way back to the 60s, even again with the LSD. There were commentators like Bear Owsley, one of the famous acid chemists, and Gerald Hurd, another writer, who saw this connection. Because what the entheogens they all have different facets of this, but it, especially working with the toad medicine with 5-MeO, which is essentially unity consciousness and deep source consciousness and this holographic awareness, not just of all space-time as one, but I have this little riff where, like, you know, we talked previously about Bardo states and the different gradations of frequencies of, of energetic intelligence mm-hmm. and awareness. And, uh, you know, they're... Ultimately, there's this inner cartography of deep source of like the white light void, intelligent, loving, radiating being of love that is deep source itself. And then around the event horizon, I have really felt uh, both ancestors and future uses and like all of us, like, you know, magnetic tape overriding itself contained within the printout of deep source as it goes from source to the event horizon to the bardos to then the material world. Um, and within that, there, there's, uh, they all have a role. They all have a, a different role within with what the antigens mm-hmm. are doing. Question. So the, guam, the shamans in a global village, mm-hmm. what do you feel that we have to learn as babies to these medicines? You know, we have cultures coming together right now uh, systems are changing even sometimes the way the medicine is used is changing as Mm -hmm. as we're interfacing with these indigenous wisdom traditions Mm -hmm. what do we have to learn in the west and how does that how will this show help support that um, Mm -hmm. meeting Souls. You know, the number one thing I think we have to learn in the West, and it's not just the West because, you know, it's not an easy dichotomy to say the West has got it all wrong and the East or the old world, no, new world. I know what you mean, but as, as, as new, a metaphor, newbies, the, the West, yeah. As newbies yeah. To, the, to these medicines and these ways, the, how, how, can we, how can we show up in a good way? Well, we can be coached in it or we can be ready. You know, or we can think we'd be ready and at least show up and put the effort into. To, it's an initiation. So, in you know, Joseph Campbell, the famous uh, academic and you know study of mythology around the world um, scholar, he had this idea of there's three phases: there's departure, initiation, and return. And so, essentially, we have we've departed from the intimacy of understanding the interconnectedness, what many indigenous cultures might say, Metakwiasen or Wankantanka or, or, you know, the, the, the great spirit which threads throughout and animates and breathes life into and is all things in manifest forms. And many indigenous cultures, whether they took uh, entheogenic substances or not, and many of them did, uh, they would use different modalities to connect to that, that unity, that feeling of interconnectedness. And within that feeling of interconnectedness is this key term, right relationship. And everything is in relationship. Mm. This is what, you know, physics and quantum physics and science can tell us, but, you know, that's more mental. But to feel that in our hearts, to feel that there is no separation between us and the wind on the water or the flowers blossoming in the essence of their perfection from the plants or, you know, another animal or another human being... We have this loneliness of individuation, and that time is coming to an end. I really feel this. So to get back to what you just said before about this ecological issue is we can think that we are responding to an ecological crisis, and wouldn't it be nice to be sustainable and eat organic food and to look at the food chain and how our actions affect each other? 
that's still the mind. That's still the empire of the mind, which is what got us into this problem in the first place. And so the empire of the mind needs to unify with the empire of the heart. Mm. And when that happens, this is what many indigenous cultures say. In Peru, they have this legend of the eagle and the condor. And the, it's the east and the west, but it also represents the mind and the heart. Mm. And many sacred teachings across the world understand this. You know, the heart has uh, brain cells in it, and it has its mm -hmm. own capacity to think. This is what science can tell us. But we need to be in touch with this, this intuition and this, this heart medicine, you know, that really to feel that we are not, you know, what I, what I understand now is like, what I understand in the heart is like, we think we're one finger, you know, we think we're an individual. And then you start to realize that we're all connected and that, that the thing that's animating, it's like the hand of God is there. But even that is just a transitory step into realizing you're this macro structure. And the macro structure is the planet. It's like we're all nerve endings of God in matter, of the divine source expressing itself. And I really, truly believe that there are, every path leads to God. You can, you can find your own path. This is nothing to be pushed. These are sacred medicines and protocols and initiations. And life itself is an initiation. It will initiate you because this is the time for planetary initiation. And this mm -hmm. is why we have a planetary emergency to a large part caused by our consciousness and to another large part caused by the phase mm -hmm. we're in in cosmic cycles. So we're not all to blame that as well as seasons of um, between the ice ages and, and, and sort of geological sort of time on the earth. I believe there's also seasons of consciousness and that, you know, the last 10,000 years or so we've done the best we have but now there's this shift in world ages which many indigenous cultures point to as well and that we're coming into unification and we're coming back into a golden age essentially mm -hmm. and that means really deeply knowing in a mind heart unification what it means not just to be human but to be the human family as part of the earth family to be interconnected with all the species with the plants and the animals and the wind and the sun and the light and the source and to hear it and to feel it and to come home, to come home again, you know, that that's where I feel we're at. And so it is my great hope that in documenting as best I can, you know, the experiences of the shamans of the global village and going around and working with the different entheogens and the medicine people, that we hold a bit of charge. We get some authenticity and some rawness. This is a independently produced documentary series, which we are relying upon the community to mm -hmm. help fund. We're going to be doing a series of crowd funds for each episode going forward. We did the first episode on our own. Um, and it is some incredibly immaculate and impeccable cinematography and direction and encapsulation of the path of these shamanic practitioners. And through them, the medicine path, I think, of all of us coming home. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. How can people Thank you. find you and donate? So uh, we have a website, com, and the show is launching on October 1st, 2016. And uh, I have a little riff. I have many riffs, but I basically, you know, they say it takes a tribe to raise a child. Mm -hmm. I, I feel it takes a tribe to support a documentary series and independent mm -hmm. filmmakers. Uh, and, you know, what, what I really, really deeply feel as well is that they say, you know, the time of the lone wolf is over and it's time for us to come together. It's time for us to support each other. It's time for us to grow together. And so I'm really asking for the support of the Global Tribe for people that are connected to medicines, plant medicines, people interested in shamanism, in spirit, in growth, in evolution, in coming home and, and, and coming together. We're just the crest of a wave here and documenting what's going on. And it's it's millions of people around the world mm -hmm. who are engaged in this process of discovery and it's nothing new this process of remembrance of what the plant medicines are revealing within ourselves because it's not like a western thing you take this thing and you have this experience you're engaging in a relationship with the spirit in the plant or, or the substance the, the sacrament and also within yourself and then also with source and so this is a is a global movement it's a, a shamanic movement which is about reconciliation and remembrance and so when we document this in the show it's your show it's your show it's 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 for you people who are doing this work and we say please join us mm -hmm. aho aho yeah <laughs> thank you so much thank you now do you 
They'll also have a separate nonprofit for the Toad Project, or is this? Gosh, I'm a busy, busy man. I can say yes. So, um, well, there's more. It's there's separate. more. There's it's a more. Separate project. There, there is no separateness. <laughs> You know, there really isn't. There really isn't. It's all just extensions another of the same thing. Another arm of those. Well, another project when I'm not doing Shamans of the Global Village or raising children or doing other things, uh, I co-founded a 501c3 not-for-profit last year called the Terra Incognita Project. So mm -hmm. it's the Latin word Terra for Earth. And it, it, Terra Incognita essentially means the invisible landscape or the, you know, the, the landscape within that you know, can't be seen. But what we're really interested in doing, we call it neuroshamanism. And in countries where it's legal, like in Mexico and other countries around the world, working with uh, the sacred bufo of Arius Toad. Uh, and um, again, I feel this is nothing new. The, the, the thing about the, the toad medicine is that there's, as you'll see in episode one of the Shamans of Global Village, um, it's been documented throughout many different Mesoamerican cultures with the Maya, with the Aztec, with the Olmecs, uh, over hundreds of years, and there's anthropological research, there's so much iconography showing things like, you know, Quetzalcoatl and then the toad there, and, and mm -hmm. they're wearing the crisscross sort of lattice work and that's on the toad, and they show the toad with the glands where the, mm -hmm. the, the venom is secreted and, and milked and then scraped and smoked. Um, there's evidence anthropologically, but there's no lineage that exists in the Mesoamerican cultures. The toads native to the Sonoran Desert and over into America, into New Mexico and areas like that. Um, but essentially it's almost as if we're having to remember from the medicine itself what's going on and to learn, mm -hmm. not just as shamanic practitioners, but the, the Terra Incognita Project is really interested in uniting the hemispheres and working with... Um, comes back to originally my first experience with 5 United the hemispheres on the earth and the brain. <laughs> because there's no separation. As above, so below. This is an ancient mm -hmm. al alchemical um, saying, you know, that everything is not just interdependent but reflects on different levels. So uh, we've been working with different neuroscientists. And the reason for this, I, I guess, I was thinking about this last week, is that 10 years ago when I was doing the Eye Awakenings book or on the journey, which became the book and then the film, Chapter 7, if you read in the book, is all about 5-MeO-DMT because out of the blue, there I was in Iquitos, had done three ayahuasca ceremonies, and then I heard about this neuroscientist, Dr. Juan Acosta, who works with EEG and a headset and 19-channel recordings of the brain and was working with uh, Ron Wheelock, who had a source of 5-MeO-DMT at the time. And 5-MeO-DMT was totally legal across the world until about 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was all completely legal. But essentially my first experience was, you know, with a blindfold, with a Western shaman, with a neuroscientist present. So my imprint and my two figures that did it, one was science and one was shamanism. And I, I went in and we recorded it. And the, the, nine, oh, yeah. the nine minutes is in the film. What you don't mm -hmm. see as much in the film is the interior heart-based recognition of pure source. And that's mm -hmm. in the book. And some of the dialogue in the film captures that. But that set the imprint. And 10 years ago, I wasn't ready to go back into deep source like that. I didn't need to go back. It was such a profound experience. I think that's why I've spent eight years, you know, anchoring it. And then what happened on the tour of the film? I meet up with Dr. Juan Acosta again. We start talking about things and we're like, you know what, let's do this. Let's Let's form a, a scientific legal body that can ex, can research what's going on in the brain and because the technology has now increased and there's a lot more um, ability to record with fine detail neurological changes of the brain mm -hmm. and work with medicine. And, and, and it's a real challenge because the tryptamine arousal and the expression of energy in the body, there's so many facets to this, but essentially I feel that um, as well as a 5-MeO deep connection to source – on more edge doses, source energy comes into the body and you can still have enough ego to recognize what's going on, but it's it's essentially at play in the fields of the Lord that this energy comes in and you recognize that you're just a finger on the hand and mm. it's come into you. But within that state, we've been getting some interesting data on what's happening neurologically, uh, essentially after a 5 ml dose in broad strokes and it Obviously, we, we, we're aiming for scientific rigor and to replicate this, you know, professionally. Uh, but essentially, there seems to be proof of a more of a resonance and a cohesion and a unification of left-right brain hemispheres. 
uh, after having done the medicine. And it's very delicate work because there's a lot of movement of the body and we're seeing a lot of spontaneous expressions of uh, Vedic truths like mudras, exp uh, you know, expression of mudras from the hands, asanas and body positions, yogic moves, breath work, all of these ancient technologies which, you know, these Eastern sort of um, cultures embodied seem to happen statistically enough to people on 5-MeO uh, organically from the medicine and the source energy shaping the body without the mind being mm -hmm. involved at all. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's showing us how to be antennas or how to be receptacles for the energy and how to express it, how to express the divine energy on earth in ways that match pretty identically a lot of these Sanskrit and, and Vedic oh, yeah. cultures. And I've talked to many that people... That medicine is mentioned in the Vedas and apparently there's some evidence that there were ayahuasca analogs along the Silk Road. Yeah. So at the beginnings yeah. of yoga mm, and mm. these traditions, um, they, they very likely could have been our earliest teachers. Well, this is what I mean. I mean, when we work with plant medicines in general, when we let go of the ego, I think what many of us realize is the teacher's not just the shaman in the room, it's the spirit of the plant itself. It's the medicine. Mm. So these medicines are the teachers. And with 5-MeO, it's not that it's like just the spirit of the toad medicine. It, it reveals and takes away all those 50,000 veils of, of, of separation between you and God mm -hmm. and lets Source in. And Source essentially says, clean up your temple. You know, clean up your temple and I'll, I'll come hang out. In the and you don't need the external trigger because nature, Source, has built in the endogenous capacity for these tryptamines. So we talked a little bit earlier about these world ages and I believe that the cascade of medicines and the healing is culminating in the, in this resurgence of 5-MeO and it's not just through toad medicine or a synthetic. I believe what we're being asked to do is to find the on switch again. Mm. You know, the, 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 the deep inner galactic on switch that says, here's what all these previous cultures on the earth had access to and it's within you and now it's time again. And mm. so, you know, that might sound really new age and really out there and really hippie. So there's that aspect, shamanic aspect, right? But we have incredibly top 1% neuroscientists mm -hmm. in their field who are interested in the physiological and neurological aspects and are rigorous scientists and are going to be doing uh, some microdose studies with Toad. Hopefully we've been working with helping uh, integrate people that have had trauma or slight sort of PTSD symptoms from not having good integration with toad medicine. We've been helping sponsor mm. a Bufo Alvarius sustainability study in yes. the Sonoran deserts. And we're only a year old. So we really, really uh, mm -hmm. need your support with this. The URL is the Terra, T-E-R-R-A hyphen incognita hyphen project dot org. Uh, and um, it's exciting times and we, we really appreciate the support of everyone because what's being revealed here, you know, is that this is a group effort. This is a, a group Absolutely. reclamation of these sacred spaces and of these modalities. And I think in unifying the science and the shamanism, even though it's very challenging and there's different languages and protocols between the two yes. communities, uh, this is what we're aiming to do. And uh, it's a long-term goal. It's a long-term work we're doing. And... Uh, it's the best work in town. I've seen a lot of fruit being born from the meeting of the shamans and the scientists. Mm. That we're doing great work as beings by because, you coming know, together. Shamans are scientists. I mean, it's it's almost an affront yeah. to, to their the cultural integrity. When I work with the curanderos in Peru, they say this is the science of curanderismo, and they call it a science. Mm -hmm. They spend twenty years or more to become a master of the diet and of cleansing their body and then to be sensitive enough to communicate with the plant spirits and all the the vast you know literally like tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of different plants and the spirits therein and then the the celestial hierarchies and if they do one thing wrong it has just as much a big reaction as a scientific oh, experiment feel that. you know it's it's different paradigms but it's same archetypes and it is, and and not to say that it's not science. There's semantics at play where mm. uh, these two streams of Western science mm. and then the worlds of shamanism 
sometimes have very different ways of getting information, mm. very different ways of studying, very different ways of research, and a great beauty is happening with the coming together and the mutual respect. And so thank you for that work. It's wonderful to know about all that you are up to. And thank you also for being one of the earliest experiential journalists that really didn't just uh, look at the shamanic experience from the outside, but you actually jumped in and let the whole world watch. And I love Aya Awakenings for being, it's much more than a documentary. It's an art film and it's poetry and it's spoken word and it, it is in a genre all its own. So. I like to say that it's a shamanic artifact because uh, the all the dialogue in the film Eye Awakenings is taken directly from the book, which was taken directly from the experience and channeled in ceremonies and in the moment, so it was fresh. It was like mm -hmm. minted fresh directly from the intuitive connection from source, and now it's anchored in the container of the film with special effects and with overlays and with narrative sort of cues and things like that. Uh, but to be a container to transmit the essence of the experience. So as opposed to just watching the film, it literally uh, catalyzes a response synesthetically from mm -hmm. the narration and the words taking up, you know, left brain, lateral sort of things, and then uh, the music and then the, the visionary stuff, which really brings you on a complete synesthetic journey. And it's as close as you can get to the real thing without doing it. And even then it's got some of the the essence in it. So my words and my media are my medicine. Yeah. And you can find that at Aya, A-Y-A hyphen awakenings.com. Beautiful.